Now, as Nigeria's 62nd Independence Day drops closer, let's look at the power sector. And Nigeria continues to grapple with inadequate electricity supply from the national grid. As unmet demand is estimated at approximately 20,000 megawatts, given the current generation of 4,000 megawatts or less on some days. An overview of the current state of the sector showed that available capacity of generation companies that's Genco's connected to the grid, increased by a meager 1,425 megawatts from 6,175 megawatts since 2015, growing to just 7,600 megawatts in the last seven years. Now, seven years into the Buhari-led administration, over 1.3 trillion naira has entered into <clears throat> the electricity sector through budgetary provisions and supports. Regardless, policy inconsistency, weak regulations, lack of transparency have weakened the country's electricity value chain. The challenges in the sector were summarized by a World Bank study in 2020, where it was revealed that about 47% of Nigerians lack access to grid electricity, and those who do have access face regular power outages. In defense of the present Buhari administration, the Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo said the President Mohamed Buhari-led administration had invested 900 billion naira in the power sector since inception. In 2018, the International Development Association, IDA, also approved $404 million facility to strengthen Nigeria's transmission network capacity. Now, despite these investments, Nigerians still experience epileptic power supply. And according to the United Nations standard, Nigeria expects to provide 1 megawatt per 1,000 people or 1,000 megawatt for every 1 million people. But currently, the country cannot meet the electricity demand for more than 40% of its citizens. The big question is, how has Nigeria's power sector performed under President Buhari's administration as energy output has been insufficient and the country has not been able to overcome the domestic power supply shortfall. Now, for further analysis, retired Air Captain Samuel Akinyele Kokrik is an aviation expert and a stakeholder in the power sector. He joins us virtually. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure to be here. Good to have you on the show. Now, before we delve into the topic, let's listen or watch this report on how the power sector has fared in the past seven years or since inception. Nigeria, we hail thee, a land rich in large oil, gas, hydro, thermal, and solar resources, enough to generate over 12,000 megawatts of electricity, yet producing and distributing a meager 4,000 megawatts on the average to over 200 million people. Going down history, Electricity generation started in Nigeria in 1896 by the first electric utility company known as the Nigerian Electricity Supply Company was established in 1929. As part of the evolution in the power industry in Nigeria, the federal government by decree number 24 of 1972 created the National Electric Power Authority. NEPA. In the year 2001, the reform of the electricity sector began with the promulgation of the National Electric Power Policy, which had as its goal the establishment of an efficient electricity market in Nigeria. In addition, the Power Holding Company of Nigeria, PHCN, was formed as a transitional corporation that comprises of the 18 successor companies, six generation companies, 11 distribution companies, and one transmission company, created from NEPA. By 2013, the privatization of all generation and distribution companies was completed with the federal government retaining the ownership of the transmission company. This privatization move has however been faulted by relevant stakeholders in the sector. From my own perspective, is for us to first of all start from 
putting the right proper regulation and policy around this. Uh, most of our regulations and policy cannot make the business to be sustainable for an average investor or an entrepreneur that is putting money around the power sector. And I'm, I'm sure uh, if we we'll go back and look at when the privatization initially was introduced, the roadmap and, you know, the kind of uh, gradual or phase increases that supposed to have happened to the pricing and the level of education that people need to have to understand that for us to have good electricity, we need to be able to pay. At the same time, government also investing infrastructure putting adequate infrastructure you know following through with most of the policy has also been a major challenge however nigerians have different views on the nation's power sector they say profitation the sector was capitalized upon no improvement i think they should return it to the the, 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 the the people who are managing before the electricity supply around there is very okay at least i can give them like 85 to um, 90 percent in virtually all the areas i've been to from the mainland to the island basically for me i think um, it has improved kind of um it's better now than um, probably two three years ago meanwhile the federal government has made several moves to salvage the alien power sector with initiatives like the National Mass Metering Program, NMMP, which was introduced in 2020. CEO Power Up Nigeria, Adetayo Adegbimli, in a virtual conversation noted that there has been a delay in kickstarting the phase one of the NMMP, which was slated to begin in August due to some infractions discovered on the part of the discos. The people that are bought into the discos bought into the discos with loans, commercial loans that they took from banks in Nigeria. Okay? So um, we are saying the 60% shares of the core, core investors was bought by loans. Now, the funny thing is that they used those 60, that 60 percent as collateral for the loans. Adetayo also explains the rationale behind the recent discourse takeover. NMMP is a wonderful idea, 6 million meters, even though it criticizes also based on, uh, on, on the 40 data that was used. I mean, NMMP was based on the data that only 64, about 64% 64 of Nigerians are omitted. Now, 64% of about 10 million registered customers in the next book comes about 6.4 million. So federal government said, okay, this is 4.5 million. We're going to raise the funds for it. We're going to loan the, the, the discos since money is the problem of the discos. We're going to loan this money on behalf of the discos and these are they're going to pay back. For the power sector of Africa's largest economy to work effectively, the federal government must take drastic steps to increase the capital allocation for the transmission company of Nigeria, TCN, including an analysis of its budget performance, solve barriers in the gas to power value chain, invest in new IT systems for discos to enable revenue collection, management and transparency, amongst other things that would lead to a general overhaul of the sector. All right, that report there, taking an overview of the Nigeria's past sector since inception. And we still have joining us virtually Samuel Cockrick, an aviation expert. Thank you so much for staying with us. All right, uh, looks like uh, we're still. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Samuel I can Cockrick? Hear you. Go ahead. Okay, so now Nigeria is gearing for its 60 second independence in about four days. Uh, what would be your assessment of the performance of the power sector under this administration in the past seven years? Okay, thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, before I can go into this, into this scorecard, let's see what we have and how they have performed. Okay. Uh, we have a stock capacity of 13,442 megawatts. Mm. That is stock capacity on ground. We have a willing capacity that's by the TCN of 7,500 megawatts. 
uh, we've uh, privatized the Jenkos, the Discos, the TCN remains with the government. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have to understand electricity as a commodity is very perishable, unlike other commodities. If I'm selling oil and uh, I produce oil and you don't and you don't buy, I put it in a drum uh, to wait for a buyer the next day. Electricity is not like that. So if, if I produce electricity and it's not used, utilized immediately, it's gone forever, wasted. Mm. So we, 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 we have all these indices, and, uh, and that, was, that is what this government met. So we have a situation whereby we have a, a stock capacity so high, and we are only, we can only evacuate about 4,000 uh, megawatts. Mm. Now, we, I think we have been too busy on and distracted with so many things. The first one is the metri, the meter. Mm-hmm. Meter is not part of generating electricity. It's just a matter of cost recovery. It's a matter of uh, social justice because if I'm metered, I should, I should be able to pay for what I use instead of somebody giving me an estimated billing. So that is not part of generating electricity. So mm-hmm. we've been distracted with that. Now, the, the issue is, has been because we have privatized two aspects of the whole ecosystem of electricity, that is between this OTC, they are with, there's going to be cost recovery because... Uh, Mr. Colcrick, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we didn't get the last part of what you said. I said... Mm. Looks like some network issues there, but we're still assessing Nigeria's power sector, especially as we get towards Nigeria's 62nd independence celebration, which is coming up on the 1st of October, about four days' time. And we're looking at some of the issues bedeviling the sector. How can they be improved? Thank you for joining us again. Okay, ma'am. Yes. Um, I don't know if I should repeat the last sentence. Please do. Okay, I said because we have privatized certain aspects, I mean, uh, 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 the discos and the jenkos, right, mm-hmm. and left the TCN with the government, right, mm-hmm. there's bound to be cost recovery because those private entities are going to borrow money to invest. Mm-hmm. They need to repay back, they need uh, returns on their investments. So cost recovery has been a big issue. It, it may be a new dimension. I'm sure most Nigerians, I mean, most Nigerians are just hearing that aspect of it for the first time. Or even if they heard, they didn't pay so much uh, attention to that. But it's very critical. It's critical in the sense that when government realizes, when they all realizes, the 1.3 trillion you're talking about has been what the government has been trying to pump in to recover when Jenko's, uh, uh, when this goes um, uh, rejects um, power from the Jenkos. Mm. Now, I will, I will explain that later. So that means money is being paid somewhere for that rejection. But that, reje- that, but that money was paid, is being paid uh, largely to the Jenkos, okay, to encourage them to continue to produce. Otherwise, they will have stopped production since. They will have stopped their... Yeah. So government came in there. Mm. But I think that was one of the problems we had. Okay. Because who do you pay? If government have paid the discos, then the Jankos will, will, because they have the meter on their side, they know that, look, I've, I've pushed out 6,000 megawatts. Mm. i supposed to be paid 6,000 megawatts. But because I put that 6,000 megawatts, I'll, and the disc, somebody is paying me, the one that is rejected, if it it's not utilized by anybody, is a waste, mm. gone, wasted not utilized by anybody. But if they had paid the discos instead of the Jankos, the, 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 the 1.3 trillion, then the, the, the Jankos will still get their money because they have a meter on their side, all right? And the discos, the one they cannot recover, they will use that subsidy from government to, to pay back. That would have been an incentive for everybody. Right now, mm-hmm. there's no incentive for the Jankos to up their production. Now, let's go to the wheeling. Go ahead, please. Mr. Colcrick, okay, uh, conversation there on the issues, factors affecting 
productivity in Nigeria's power sector as we get uh, prepared towards the 62nd celebration of our independence and also looking or assessing the Buhari administration's performance in the power sector. Welcome back, Mr. Colcrick. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, like I was saying, the, the, so we have a mismatch everywhere. And uh, now let's go back to the government. Have they done well? Well, in the light of their knowledge, in the light of the general knowledge, they have made some progress. But then the, the whole issue has been misunderstood from the one. Mm. Nobody is talking about what I am saying now. And if they do, very few of us are doing that. Uh, it's, it's a different aspect. Cost recovery is an issue. Now, let, why, is, why is it so difficult to recover cost? It's difficult to recover cost in the, to the, to recover cost of a perishable commodity if there is, there is inconsistency. Mm. The inconsistency in the sense that the, 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 the consumers should know when to expect light in every area. Mm. Once they know that, they will adjust their lifestyle to consume power because it's the cheapest means of um, uh, power, of energy. Mm -hmm. That is the grid. Mm -hmm. So, but because that we don't know, right? okay, today, if they, if they took my light in the morning, I would have done something else with my generator. Mm -hmm. So when they bring back light, I don't need their power again mm -hmm. for those things I've set, I've set up my generator. Mm -hmm. But if I knew there's going to be power at a particular state, I will, I will adjust my I will adopt. I will adapt to it. Adjust my lifestyle to the point so that I can take advantage of a cheaper electricity. Okay, so, um, Mr. Kalkrik, I know there are you know several issues. It's a plethora of issues when it comes to the power sector. But let's also right. talk about the grid collapse. You know, just yesterday there was another reported grid collapse, and uh, you know they reported that it was due to some system frequency failure. And uh, this is like the seventh time the grid will be collapsing just this year. What do you think is the major challenge with Nigeria's power sector, and what are the sustainable solutions, especially as we work towards having better power supply in the country? That is very simple. Most Nigerians have generators. They know the limitations of that generator. If they, if you subject it to the way we've we've all subjected the the, uh, the low capacity grid, right, they will have experienced the same system failure with their generators. Mm. It is a simple thing. You cannot overload an electrical system. You see, as we apply as we apply um, uh, appliances, because mm. that is what they call the, the appliances, the, the the application of electricity in our various um, uh, homes and, and factories, right? Creates disturbances on the grid. Mm. That, is, that, is, that, is, that is expected. So a grid must have a reserve to absorb that shock. Because like generators, I mean like uh, air conditioners, when I put on my air conditioner and the, uh, and the compressor kicks in, the compressor is, a, is an electric motor. For an electric motor to start, it needs six times the rate of power. So let's say my my motor my my my, my uh, com compressor is ready at 200 um, uh, uh, watts. So it needs 1,200 watts to start it. The moment it starts, it goes back to 200. Mm. So those surges, those surges, you need a reserve to, to absorb. But we don't have enough. Mm. So we don't have because we don't have enough, right? That is why we have that thing consistently. Siemens is coming in. Okay. And the first thing Siemens is arrested is that to stop system collapses. How are they going to do it? They are going to switch me off if I'm the one causing, causing the disturbance on that okay. line. They will, they will cut me off. Mm. Well, they cannot cut me off directly in my house, but they'll cut my area off, right? So that means with the Siemens coming in, there will still be outages, but there will be no more system collapses because it, it will have been automated. Mm. You well, know, you, you sound you know, very so, optimistic about the Siemens arrangement, especially with the federal no, government. No, no, no. The, the, the optimism is that there will still be there will still be outages. In fact, serious outages, but there will be no more system collapse. That, that means the whole system will not collapse, mm. but my area will collapse. The area that is causing that disturbance, will, will collapse it. 
Okay. Do you understand? It's right. affect, affecting the whole country. Yes. So do you see so, the Muhammad Buhari led administration tackling all of these issues? You've talked about several issues bedeviling the sector. Do you think that this administration, they have, uh, they have just a few months to leave office. Do you think they would be able to make a marked difference in the remaining months? Look, I wrote a book, uh, Power in Nigeria, whatever I like. It's available. Uh, uh, anybody can Google it. It's free download. It can be done within in less than in less than four months if they want to do it. If they follow what I said in the book, what I said in the book is that to start with, because it's overloaded, we have so many sectors. Cut off a particular sector. I suggested cut off the industrial sector. Mm. People will say, "Oh, ah, if you cut off the industrial sector, why? It's going to affect. It's not going to affect anything. It is not going to affect. What is affecting the sales of it, our local industry is the quality." If we have very great quality, no matter the cost of production, it will sell worldwide. It will sell in Nigeria, it will sell worldwide. Look at our cable. Look at our cable and wires. It is, it is one of the best in the world. If, if we are not number two, we will be number three in the world. Mm. People come as far as Turkey to come and buy our cable because of quality. It's still, it's still produced with, this, with still the same no light. So if we cut them off, then we concentrate on the households. Everybody, when they go back home, there's light. Mm. Every, the household and small businesses, the SMEs, then we build it up from there. Then we will be able to stabilize. That is what I said. That can be done within four months. Okay. And everybody will be happy. So it means you're expectant, you're optimistic that this administration will be able to no, make I'm not some needed changes. No, I'm not changes. optimistic if they follow my idea, mm. what I've just said. All right. It can be done. And it's, only, it's, a, it's not going to cost them a dime. It's just a policy issue. Mm. The government comes and they say, you know what? I want you to disconnect the industrial sectors. Let them go on the and whatever. Else. And besides, uh, well, we're you, really, you can link. We're pressed for time, Mr. Carl Creek, but we really appreciate you for the insight shared this morning on the show. Thank you so much and have a good day. Anytime. All right. Bye for anytime. Now. Thank you so much. All right. We'll take okay, you then, straight bye -bye. to the global oil market. Brent crude futures for November settlement rose 65 cents to $84.71 per barrel in early trade. Oil prices on Tuesday after plunging to nine month lows on a day earlier on indications that producer alliance OPEC Plus may enact output cuts to avoid a further collapse in prices. Brent crude futures for November settlement rose 65 cents or 0.77 percent to $84.71 per barrel in early trade as U.S. West Texas Intermediate WTI crude futures for November delivery were up 64 cents at $77.35 per barrel. In the previous two trading sessions, Brent plunged 7.1 percent while WTI slumped 8.1 percent under the dual pressure of a surging dollar that makes greenback denominated crude more expensive for buyers using other currencies and mounting concerns that rising interest rates will trigger a recession that will curtail fuel demand. On Tuesday, an easing greenback provided some relief to the oil market. The dollar index was off a bit from the 20-year high touched on the previous day. Officials from major producers reacted to the past days of declines by indicating they may take action to keep price stability. And with that, it's a wrap on Business Breakfast. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. My name is Omobolanli Adeshi. Have a fine day.